Good morning to you once again, and thank you very much for staying with Metropole. You're right in time for Business AM, and right now we want to do the Metropole review, but I'm not alone in studio. Joining me, Ian Moravi, an investment analyst at Cyton. Thank you very much for making time. Thank you. We are great that you're here. We start off with our first story, which is Treasury gets 125 billion loan to refinance debt. Now, just to put that story into perspective, the Treasury has taken a new $1.25 billion medium-term syndicated loan between January and March to retire maturing short-term foreign loans in a move to ease debt repayment pressure on the exchequer. The Treasury said it took out 25.33 billion Kenya shillings to pay off a short-term loan that was due in January and another 99.2.73 rather billion Kenya shillings under the then prevailing exchange rate in March to repay a two-year um, $760 million syndicated loan procedure in 2017. Now this is the state of the Kenyan economy and I'd like to start by asking is Kenya having difficulty servicing its loans? That's why we are opting to go for more loan to refinance our debt. Uh, you'd say so, mm -hmm. uh, simply because, for instance, if you look at KRA's uh, collection targets, they, they missed their collection targets. So they're finding it uh, a bit uh, difficult to raise the funds so as to repay the debt. And that's why they would have to uh, raise additional debt mm -hmm. to refinance existing debt. But it's also a ploy by the exchequer to try and uh, lengthen its maturity profile because you want to, you do ideally want to reduce uh, the maturity concentration risk whereby you have a lot of uh, debt maturing over a, a specific period in time so as to lengthen the period. Mm -hmm. So ideally, um, the main, that was, that's one of the main uh, reasons why uh, the National Treasury has been raising debt to finance existing debt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk about the strategy of using debt to finance debt. Is it really a good strategy in terms of trying to wipe clean your slate in relation to debt? Now, um, ideally it, it may not be a good um, strategy mm -hmm. simply because, for instance, uh, it depends on what the debt has initially been used for. Because if you find that you, you are using your debt probably to fund your uh, recurrent expenditure. It means that uh, the debt did not yield any additional uh, income or revenue or create uh, capital goods in the economy. So um, ideally you'd want whereby a debt is being used uh, in the creation of capital in an economy. But uh, in this case, if you are using debt to, for example, fund your recurrent expenditure, it means that uh, there's a strain that you are putting uh, on, on the taxpayers and it will reflect in, uh, going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. You likely see uh, the debt uh, rising, yet there's nothing to show for it. So uh, the, ring, the risk of uh, using debt to refinance uh, debt is you risk falling into a debt trap. Mm -hmm. You keep on borrowing to repay existing debt. So they use of those funds uh, remains one of the critical things that uh, will determine how useful the debt you take is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, longevity in terms of the long-term strategy. Kenya's debt keeps piling. We are at 5.4 trillion Kenya shillings. What are some of the long-term plans that the government can put in place to ensure that we can uh, finance our debt without solely relying on debt to ask for more maturity period? Um, Ideally, in my view, one of the best things the government may do is simply uh, to create the enabling environment for individuals to conduct business. Now, one of the main one of the main reasons that uh, causes the national treasury to keep on raising debt to finance uh, debt is simply because they are not able to generate enough uh, revenue, uh, tax revenue, for example, uh, to finance their own activities. So they result to taking up debt to finance the shortfall. So ideally, the, the national treasury or the government at large may be better placed if um, they would uh, use the debt to create, possibly create an enabling environment in the economy, mm -hmm. uh, making business uh, conducive to conduct within the economy. When you have more businesses uh, doing well, generating revenues, profitability, it's likely to yield higher revenue for the national treasury mm -hmm. and may reduce the budget shortfall. So creating that enabling environment is likely uh, to bring in some income. They may result to other measures such as uh, increasing the tax bracket. Uh, inclu they including, tried that. Yeah, they tried that. The informal sector that is. Uh, if you look at currently where we stand is that the informal tax sector, not all of it, uh, is within the taxable profile. So they would want ideally to bring in uh, additional people into the tax bracket and reduce the strain on the individuals within the bracket. So. 
uh, that's one of the main reasons, one of the main things or rather the government or the national treasury may opt to do. Mm. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, we cannot run away from accountability because accountability also remains an important aspect that determines whether we are getting uh, the value of our money or whether we are getting the short end of the stick. So we may, we may want to have accountability whereby you can say these funds uh, have been used for these purposes and no uh, corrupt activities and whatsoever have occurred. Mm -hmm. So that, those are some of the main uh, things I would, my view, the government may need. Accountability goes forward. hand in hand with asset reclamation. Where are we at in this country? Because a lot of money is always stolen and we see some people are taken to court and convicted uh, as purported. But in relation to the money they stole and reclaiming it back so that it can be injected into the economy mm. so that we don't end up with bad debt. How are we doing and how should it be done? Uh, the go we've, we've seen uh, the push by government, uh, some of government agencies in terms of trying to enforce strict regulations, uh, conducting prosecutions and whatnot. But uh, something that Kenyans uh, have always uh, uh, been concerned about is that the prosecutions don't really tend to go all the way because it, uh, you tend to find that uh, most of these culprits uh, who conduct these activities, they, they do not come to book, most of them do not come to book and the amounts are yet to be recovered to date from mm -hmm. Kenyan's point of view. So um, the government may, I think uh, it's, a, it's a thorny issue that uh, the country as a whole may need to deal with uh, because um, if you, and it, one of the things that uh, is being uh, proposed is that we need to strengthen our institutions and ensure that uh, they are independent in their, in their conduct. So to ensure that uh, they can be able to run the full uh, end or rather the full journey of uh, trying to reclaim, uh, for example, the stolen assets and maybe prosecute uh, the culprits involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there you have it. Um, the government needs to streamline the business sector so that there's ease of doing business and also fiscal accountability. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. One of the ways to ensure that we finance our debt the right way and don't end up in debt. Let's take a look at our second story. KRA seizes 438 cars as higher duty hits dealers. Now, about 438 vehicles are stuck at the port of Mombasa as their importers struggle to offset high duty charges imposed by the Kenya Revenue Authority. Last month, the taxman reviewed its valuation schedule, the current retail selling price of many models of vehicles rise sharply, causing dealers to abandon their cars at the ports. Now, dealers claim due to high levy, it's almost impossible to sell cars and get any profit out of the business. Instead, they are running losses. Now, Ian, mm. is it time that we review the levy on imported cars for the sake of those who are employed in this sector? Uh, the automobile sector, it has been fraught by several challenges, especially last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, those challenges have spilled over into 2019, to this year. And uh, what you tend to find is that f from industry reports you, we see is that uh, the car sales have gone down into this year. And they are, for instance, in the luxury uh, segment, the sales have uh, declined sharply in 2019 and uh, towards the end of 2018. And uh, given that uh, most of the dealers in this uh, sector are, they rely on, they have thin margins on their on their businesses, and also they rely on volume sales. So you tend to find that uh, if, for instance, the high the le le levy charge increases, then it ideally reduces their margins. And then when you compound that with the fact that there are few sales happening, then dealers are, will automatically be uh, in a tight spot because they may not be able to generate enough. Uh, uh, profitability, for instance, to maybe increase your stock or maybe mm -hmm. pay for stock that has already been ordered for. Mm -hmm. So it's an industry that uh, it's one of the most, uh, it's, a, it's a highly taxed industry when you compare with other countries in terms of the levies charged. And uh, I think there may need to be a review, but it, it, in, in fact, uh, it's part of government policy, in fact, to try and uh, tax this in terms of probably, uh, probably um, the emissions, things like uh, the emissions and all that. So they try and use uh, those as well in terms of their policy direction. But uh, uh, I think going forward, uh, if things do not improve, um, I think dealers may continue be in hard times. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, there's the national automotive policy that mm. has been fronted. And uh, automotive dealers 
denied that policy and uh, they revoked it and declared it null and full. However, one can't help but wonder, is this a move by the government to choke car importation so as to inject life in local manufacturing and um, auto assembly of motor vehicle? We, we know the president is big on this in his big four agenda in the manufacturing facet, and he's been talking about this a lot lately. So is this a move to clearly wipe off importation and build the local industry? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a move to try and promote local industries by charging higher levies on imported uh, automobiles. However, it for Kenyans, uh, if you look at the large proportion of automobiles produced, they are mainly the commercial ones. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you high, charge high levies on the commercial uh, vehicles, for instance, you are in essence trying to promote uh, the local uh, assembly lines and uh, local producers. However, what happens then uh, to the retail uh, vehicles? So mm -hmm. need, there may need to be a streamline in terms of the policy yeah. that is involved between uh, various categories of automobiles. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do they create a, a harmonious transition mm -hmm. between importing cars and growing the local industry? Because a time has to come when we must build Kenya and buy Kenya and yeah. sell Kenya. Yeah. But it can't be a one-off. It has to True. be a harmonious transition. Yeah. How should the government go about that? Uh, I think uh, the incentives have been there mm -hmm. to own locally produced automobiles. And uh, one of the things that uh, Kenyans have always had concerns about has been quality. So I think Kenyans may need to be con convinced of the quality of uh, all the automobiles that are produced, for instance, locally. And then when you add in some in incentives uh, such as uh, probably the price that a Kenyan may have to pay, uh, for these automobiles, if uh, the incentive is there and then uh, you've convinced them of quality, then it's likely uh, to ideally try and ensure that there's a smooth transition uh, organically in the market mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the imported vehicles to the locally assembled vehicles. Okay, yeah. there you have it. Now let's move on to our third story of the day, and that's why Kenyans and Africans do not feel economic growth. Now. Before I read this story, there's a clip I'll play, we'll play at the end of uh, a vox pop of what Kenyans think in relation to the economic growth and, gr and uh, job creation because one of our reporters went out to the field and Kenyans had a lot to say about this. But just before you listen to the vox pop, let's put the story into perspective. Now last year, Kenya's economy grew by 6.0% and East Africa grew by 6.1% and Africa 3.2%. Now according to the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, report, the cre the, they created over 840,000 jobs, that's the government, yet Kenyans on the ground do not feel the impact of this development. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, one of our reporters went out to the field and spoke to people, and um, this is what they had to say in relation to economic growth and job creation. Audi, do you have that?
Well, Ian, those are the sentiments of Kenyans on the street. And do those numbers really reflect the situation on the ground? 840,000 jobs, according to the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics 2019 Economic Survey Report. But that's what Kenyans are saying. Why the contrast? Um, if you look at, for instance, the numbers that Kenyan, the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics says, uh, the economic growth, in essence, Kenyans do not feel that economic growth. There seems to be a mismatch in terms of uh, the numbers that we, we, we get and uh, the feel on the ground. Uh, and in my view, this has to do with what actually drives GDP growth, because in this essence, uh, we are talking about GDP growing by 6%. And so um, one of the key things that may make the GDP to grow is uh, the government expenditure. And you look at, uh, if you look at 2018, uh, there was a lot of uh, government-driven expenditure. And uh, this tends to be concentrated only in a few sectors. So this may not be inclusive of all sectors that, uh, in the economy. And that, that means that uh, Kenyans may, in essence, who are not in these particular sectors, may not feel any resultant effect. And 2018, 2018 was a particularly harsh, uh, they had a, a bit of a tough economic environment mm -hmm. because if you look at several sectors such as uh, trade, real estate, these are sectors that were fraught with several challenges in 2018. Uh, and this had to do with various factors such as uh, delayed government payments, the effects of 2017 spilling over to 2018. And so these effects affected a lot of people. Uh, and so the essence did, did not feel any improvement and uh, only Kenyans in a few sectors such as agriculture, tourism, they mm -hmm. did see marked changes from uh, 2017. Mm -hmm. And so that remains one of the key things that uh, brings about that mismatch in terms of uh, how to feel the economic growth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now in relation to job creation, 840,000 jobs if the government created those jobs mm -hmm. is no main fit. But it's not enough. So just hypothetically, how many jobs does the government need to create on a yearly basis to feed demand? And in what sectors so that uh, people can feel the effect of economic growth? Uh, in terms of job creation, uh, we still remain, in terms of the unemployment rate, uh, it still remains high. Uh, the numbers have been disputed before. So yeah. uh, there are several sectors that I, I would ideally be uh, very suitable in terms of uh, trying to ease that unemployment burden on the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the key things is uh, we need to promote uh, in terms of in, in creating a conducive environment for the operations of the micro, small and medium enterprises. And what you tend to find is that 80% of the private sector are these MSMEs. And so, um, and most of them are in agri-business because agriculture again contributes 20% uh, of our GDP. Uh, so a focus on what uh, the economy ideally is good at, I think would be a be best place because it would not require any significant deployment in terms of capital to try and create employment. Mm -hmm. However, there is also the general feel that uh, we need to diversify our economy. We cannot focus on agriculture alone. So we also need to promote other sectors of the economy. We also have sectors such as the manufacturing. By creating a conducive uh, manufacturing environment, mm -hmm. this would enable the, the segment to ideally attract more employment uh, in terms of uh, probably the, if you look at the number of graduates who get out of school every year, number from tertiary colleges, all that. So you need to also create and expand other sectors of the economy, such mm -hmm. as manufacturing real estate and ICT. Mm -hmm. So we may ride on our strength in those, in some of those key segments to try and create employment, uh, especially for the young population. Okay. Yeah. Diversification of the Kenyan economy to expand our revenue basket. That's one of the ways to go in relation to um, job creation in the Kenyan market. Abracadabra, there you have it. Nairobi building project falls by 12% now. Nairobi private construction last year registered a 12.8% fall with 210 billion projects approved compared to 240.8 billion worth of projects in 2017. This is much lower than the five-year high registered in 2016 when investors injected 308.4 billion into newly approved project. Now let's contextualize this fall because um, experts, one, say one of the reasons is regulatory delays in approving projects. What are your two cents on that? Uh, it's actually true uh, in terms of uh, 
getting approvals for construction, uh, in, especially in Nairobi, uh, it takes a bit of time. And so developers have been uh, have been at a fix because it it, uh, it will you know because they're also funding uh, their uh, developments probably using that. Mm -hmm. So when it becomes uh, it becomes a long a long period for you to obtain your approvals and whatnot, it tends to increase your finance costs mm -hmm. so it may not be ideally investment uh, uh, conducive for you as an investor mm -hmm. or a dev as a developer to come up with a, a building given uh, due to those delays now another thing has also been the fact that uh, if you look at real estate as a sector as a whole in 2018 it was a particularly tough year because for instance if you look at banks uh, some of the large uh, listed banks in kenya they touted real estate as one of the key sectors that uh, made them experience high levels of non-performing loans. Mm -hmm. So banks have tended to shun away or rather reduce the exposure into real estate mm -hmm. to try and simply cut those, curb those, uh, those uh, non-performing loans from real estate. Uh, and these, so the lack of funding, uh, ready funding for real estate uh, ensured that developers ideally did not uh, become as active as much in in real estate in 2018. Mm -hmm. So there's also the issue of uh, oversupply in particularly particular segments of real estate. And so given that, that environment, there was a slow uptake in 2018. So for most developers or investors, they, they opted not to get into the sector and okay. wait, adopted a, probably a wait and see uh, attitude to see where the sector would be in 2018 before mm -hmm. making any, any moves in the sector. Let's also talk about diminishing access to credit from local finances, and this has become uh, this has been related to the interest rate caping bell. And CS Rotich, during his speech at the release of the 2019 Economic Survey report, said it's something that has to be looked into and reviewed. What's your take? Uh, I agree with him completely, uh, because since the inception of the interest uh, rate cap in the Banking Amendment Act of 2015. There's been a very, very slow credit extension, particularly to the private sector, because you've seen private sector credit growth remain below uh, 5%, whereas before uh, the rate cap, it used to average uh, above 14%. So because this is, has mainly been because banks have been citing the, the fact that you cannot price uh, some of these uh, borrowers within the margin set mm -hmm. and have instead opted to lend to the government. So the, in my view, there needs to be a review in terms of uh, the, that piece of uh, legislature mm -hmm. simply to try and improve uh, the access to credit. Because if we look at uh, the, one of the main reasons why the bill or the law was put in place was to ensure that one, uh, it's easy for Kenyans on the private sector businesses, small businesses to access credit. Okay. But that has not been the case. Mm -hmm. uh, credit has been very low. Mm -hmm. uh, people are not receiving credit, especially the small businesses. And so it has failed to achieve its main objective. Okay. So if there was a review of the law, uh, we think that uh, it should ideally help uh, in terms of uh, growing businesses because if a business cannot access credit, they cannot grow. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, one of the key things that uh, has been proposed is that uh, perhaps we may widen the margins that are available. Uh, if you look, if you remember, there was a bill proposed some time back last year to try and increase it to six percent above the thirteen percent maximum. So, such initiatives would ideally help uh, banks to be able to price in uh, these small businesses in that uh, risk profile to ensure that they can be given access to credit. Okay. Yeah. Very briefly, as mm. we wind up this segment, mm. there'll always be a trickle-down effect when one sector is not doing well. For example, when the real estate sector is not doing well, what other sectors suffer and how? Very briefly, as we wind up. Uh, other sectors that may suffer will include construction mm -hmm. as well. Construction simply because they supply uh, some of these uh, materials for the real estate sector. Uh, ICT as well, uh, it, it has been growing uh, and it's one of the sectors that uh, is likely to be affected. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the two uh, main sectors that will likely uh, be affected. Well, before mm -hmm. I let you go, mm -hmm. it's in the morning and people are placing their bet. Mm -hmm. I want you to put your money where your mouth is. Which sector or which stock are you placing your bet on? Uh, for me, where I stand, I would place my funds in the banking sector, mm -hmm. simply because if you look at the performance of the sector, even last year, when a majority of other 
farms in other sectors were giving profit warnings. Uh, you see, we did see profitability rising to record highs last year. Mm -hmm. So at the current environment, we've seen a, a lot of these stocks are cheaply priced in terms of uh, the discount you get to their book value. Mm -hmm. And so we think that uh, given the prospects going forward and the discount present, uh, we think that uh, it's one of the best times to be a buyer in that segment. Well, thank you very much, Ian. We say put your money where your mouth is. Ian is putting his money in the banking sector. Talk to us at Metropole TV. KE is our digital handle across all social media platforms. Hashtag Business AM. Where are you placing your money on? Or rather, which industry are you placing your bet on? Thank you very much, Ian, for making time. And we're looking forward to having you so that we can have a deep dive into the real estate sector and understand it better. Thank you. Thank you for making time. We want to take a short breather to bring you commercial messages. But on the other side, Martin will be joining main studio to have a conversation on social entrepreneurship for social transformation. Stay with Metropole TV. Welcome back to Business AM with me and Doro Ganga, the last segment of the show. And we are having a sit-down conversation with Martin Irungu, who's the CEO of Gr Grassroot rather, Entrepreneurship Summit. And he's big on social entrepreneurship, and he says it's the key to social transformation. Now, before we start the conversation, just to lay into context what we want to talk about, only 10 out of 100 ideas survive to implementation stage, okay? And only three out of five SMEs make it beyond their third birthday. Now, beyond their third birthday, only one makes it to their fifth birthday. And we want to have a conversation around this and see how we can harness the power of social enterprises and small and medium enterprises so that they can grow, create jobs, and help transform the Kenyan economy. Thank you very much, Urungu, for making time. Thank you so much. Just to start the conversation, from where you sit, inside out perspective, what is the state of social entrepreneurship in the country? Uh, thank you so much for having me in the show. Uh, first of all is to say uh, social entrepreneurship is on the rise. It is on demand. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's one of the things that is really changing in the lives of, of people in communities. Uh, the stakeholders, the government, the players, the enablers, the, uh, the incubators are also on the rise to support. Uh, social entrepreneurship and of course as a global priority in terms of the sustainable development goals then we have to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are some of the needs in the society that are pushing towards social entrepreneurship? Is there a need for social entrepreneurship and maybe what problem is social entrepreneurship providing solutions to? Uh, first of all I, I would like to bring uh, to the attention of the viewer of what is this difference between the conventional business and the social enterprise. Mm -hmm. A social enterprise uh, really uh, puts uh, the people or the communities at the heart of the design program. Mm -hmm. Where else we, when you're designing for a mainstream business, we are focusing on profits, margins, and growth. Uh, not to say that a social entrepreneur will not focus on profits, but they will have the people at the heart, the bigger goal of a social enterprise is social change. Mm -hmm. And coming to your question, when you are talking about uh, what the social enterprises are doing, they are really now uh, transforming the challenges that are facing communities into an enterprise. Mm -hmm. And basically that's now in terms of health, agriculture, education, energy, in all the fields uh, of sustainable development. Mm -hmm. We have social entrepreneurs focusing on growing social enterprises that are increasing or improving the lives of people in those sectors. Mm -hmm. So you're saying the need of the society is triggering the rise of social entrepreneurship to provide solutions to the challenges that normal people face on a normal basis. Exactly. Like now we are talking about, uh, we have had a drought season when we have had so many people dying. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are now dealing with the floods, so it's a social challenge. So now the social entrepreneurs are coming in to ask themselves, like 
we have had drought. How do we improve resilience of communities uh, to deal with the hunger, for example? Mm -hmm. So they are talking about enhancing food security at household level uh, through social businesses. That is now where they're do talking about enhancing uh, the, uh, the production, uh, to talk about the value addition, talk about preventive, uh, preventive against diseases that are affecting the crops mm -hmm. that are resilient to drought. So social entrepreneurs come in handy to deal with the social challenges that we face day to day. And then at the same time, they also have to be sustainable. It's not a humanitarian aspect as per uh, the humanitarian world. The social entrepreneurs come in to, to think of ideas, creative and innovative ideas that are sustainable. Mm -hmm. Very well. Now, I want us to talk about some of the um, measures that are being put in place to grow social entrepreneurship. Because we know that most businesses do not survive beyond their third birthday. And it's a miracle if they go beyond their fifth birthday. And, um, their incubation centers. Last year we were together at the Grassroots Entrepreneurship Summit that was held at the Kenyatta University and the Kenyatta University has the Manu Chandara Incubation Center but that's just one. Okay so as we start talking about incubation center what role does incubation centers play in the growth of a business? Before you start allow me to borrow your pen. Thank Great you so okay. So uh, let me uh, come into how the ecosystem look like. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are talking about social entrepreneurship and also the, uh, the SMEs, we are having an ecosystem that has accelerators mm -hmm. uh, or enablers. For instance, for us, we are an enabler. Uh, EMSA as an enabler, it's an NGO that focuses on the grassroots incubations. Mm -hmm. we ha in the Nairobi itself, we have over 50 hubs or innovation hubs, hubs that are existing to support young and upcoming entrepreneurs. But at the same time, there is also now the quest of asking ourselves, these young entrepreneurs are designing solutions for communities that are not only in Nairobi. Okay. So the focus now has been how do the ecosystem support them that are now at the grassroots level, at the county level, at the far away from the town. So mm -hmm. the ecosystem now uh, focuses on uh, providing providing solution in terms of incubating ideas. Basically, when you are, uh, we are designing ideas, you uh, uh, we understand the challenge that a startup will go through. The same challenges the young startups and the social enterprise end will still go through the same challenges. So the enablers, the incubators, the accelerators come in to try and support the ecosystem mm -hmm. and the young entrepreneurs to the point that they are able to test the ideas, they are able to pilot the ideas, mm -hmm. they are able to make a case, be able even to face out with the venture funds and such that comes in in the growth stage. Mm -hmm. So. How do we increase incubation hubs and how do we equip them so that they're better placed to help SMEs, particularly in the social entrepreneurship sector, to grow? Uh, in the, on this note, we, also, we, we have to really demystify what is the purpose of an accelerator, what is the purpose of an incubator. And in this note, what challenge we have faced, for instance, in a, uh, as an enabler in the, in the space, we have space like this hall, mm -hmm. but the utilization uh, by the young entrepreneurs is not, uh, is not, is not on, th on the trend. So the, the, ask, the question we ask ourselves, what is the problem that is, uh, that is f making these young people not able even to utilize the, uh, the available resources? Mm -hmm. And on that note, you'll find whatever incubation centers that you have set in place, they have quite a bit of demands. Like, have you proven your case? And for me and my understanding is, I don't have to prove the case. I need to, the incubator to support me to prove the case. So I think it is the high time and that is the conversation we have been pulling together, even doing the grassroots entrepreneurship summit, trying to push now the voice of the young entrepreneur to the table and now le letting the enablers listen to them. Mm -hmm. And that's now the, some of the cries that you, you listen and, uh, and find out. That it's the high time now we also think about. I don't have to come all the way from Garissa, for example. I am designing a solution for Garissa County. And then I travel all the way to Nairobi to devise the solution. Mm -hmm. The counties, the, the enablers need to have a way of, of having a devolved function around 
uh, incubation and acceleration processes to be able to support young entrepreneurs from where they are. Mm -hmm. That is why we have upcoming colleges in every different region. We have to take advantage of the systems mm -hmm. just to be able to have more and more of such enabling environment within the sub-regions that we have in the country. Funding. One of the biggest challenges of entrepreneurs across the board, but in relation to social entrepreneurship, because you're trying to find solutions, funding is very critical. How do we go about it in relation to sourcing for more funds and making funds available to people in the social entrepreneurship space and giving them time? Because projects, when they're not based on profit, do not pick up immediately. And maybe they might not even be of profit immediately. Uh, let me first of all put this into perspective. Just to say, a social enterprise um, really suffers f on the fact that there is no, like say the financial institutions, like the banks that are out there looking for social enterprises to give them funding based on the fact that their biggest interest is social impact and profit comes second. Uh, that a little bit brings a bit of a comparison looking at what happens now in the mainstream business where you have to prove the, the point that you're able to make profits and the margins and then you get some, some amount. Uh, that puts them in an awkward situation. And now within that uh, ecosystem, that is now where we have the venture funding coming in. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a challenge for an upcoming social entrepreneur who needs to prove the case. And now that calls for alternative funding. What is the alternative funding in the space? That is now what we are championing for. Because we, have, we are asking ourselves for you to get funding for anyone to support your idea. They really need to see it happening. They really need to see that impact. They really want to see the sustainability model. Like you have to prove the case. At the same time, we also need to raise the leaders who are supporting the social businesses to be able to speak about the case. Because the co proponent of a business or a social enterprise has a, a like three facets. We have to look at the enterprise itself. You cannot separate the, the social enterprise with the social entrepreneur. At the same time, we also have to look at the community or the persons, the focus, the customer in this, in this context. How do these three facets interact? How do we strengthen the model to be able to be beyond reproach? Mm -hmm. And then that will also now call um, even the mainstream funding to come in to support such, such startups. Mm -hmm. But then do we have such patient funding? For example, you need to have a fund for three years before you are able to have a profit margin. So then that brings a bit of question, which are the other funding? Mm -hmm. And of course, we have the development organizations uh, that now have been coming in, breaking out, breaking down their funding, uh, their funding to be able to get to the grassroots, to be able to support the very early stage young social enterprises. Mm -hmm. Nice. So they have funding if we can get alternative means of funding that are more patient with social entrepreneurs. What other ways can we use to unlock the potential of social entrepreneurship and churn new paths for them, particularly when they're in their early stage of startups? Uh, basically, we also need to focus on growing the leader in the social enterprise. I think uh, what we have seen even within the ecosystem, the, uh, the startups that have grown very fast have grown out of the leadership of the founders and the skill composition. Like some of the biggest challenges we find we face around social entrepreneurship is the mix of the skills. For us, what we have always done in the um, young entrepreneurs that we support, we always ask you, what uh, skills do you have to drive the social enterprise? What is the team composition, for instance? I've seen, for, for instance, a young entrepreneur who is interested in a digital uh, startup, but then they don't have the skill. So they want somebody to support them to develop this digital system. But then you ask them, how do you sustain this? Mm -hmm. Who would you team up? Would you look for a co-founder, for example, to be able to support your startup? So there are other factors that enablers can be doing in terms of giving them a vision, understanding the market. When we are talking about the market, it still applies even within the ecosystem of social entrepreneurship. Because we are focusing on, does this make sense to the community? Does it make sense at all? What about the market analysis? 
what bringing the users this is what we call the human centered design thinking like how do you bring the users at the center of your development how do you get feedback mm -hmm. is the is the innovation is the startup that you are running appropriate at this stage so there are other details enablers can be doing in terms of supporting the young entrepreneurs giving them a strategy plan how do they work on their strategy how do they work on their clientele how do they work on the communities how do they place the people at the center of their design thinking at the same time how do they sharpen how do they hone their skills around the social enterprise that they are driving mm -hmm. how do they compose the team if they miss this the skill those are some of the details that we work around and that is now some of the things that the enablers within the ecosystem would be doing mm -hmm. to support the enterprise. Now a young social entrepreneur might be watching and maybe their business is not doing really well. There might be a mistake they're making somewhere. So just to contextualize, what are some of the common mistakes that social entrepreneurs make in their journey? Yeah, thank you so much. I think I have mentioned a number of them. And f the biggest mistake, according to me, uh, is their market orientation, their market uh, analysis, their target. Sometimes, even the timing. There is something that is interesting. For instance, just to give a, a very uh, good example, we had the digital cards that were introduced uh, by the government. And it looks like an amazing startup, a very nice uh, social enterprise because they are really solving a bit problem of corruption. They were dealing uh, with efficiency and speed. But to me, the market was not ready for the startup. So, and still applies to the young startups who are in the market, in the communities, driving social change because social entrepreneurs are really passionate about what they do and they believe in what they have to transform. But then, do they have the people again? the human-centered approach. How do they put the people at the center? So you'll find that a young entrepreneur, a young social entrepreneur, will not do quite a bit of market research, especially in the social entrepreneurship, because they believe in the change as opposed to the process. So they have seen the end result. They have seen a, a place with the lower mortality rates, as opposed to how will I do the process. So the social entrepreneur looks at the change and then forgets of the process. How do you put the people who you are designing the solution for at the center of your process? So that is a one of the biggest mistakes. I've mentioned something to do with the composition, the skills. Yeah, the skill set. No, the skill can. set. It's not about the money. It's not about the capital because you'll find them, they'll tell you, I just don't have money to do the thing. But then you ask them, some of the resources that you need is just a skill to develop the tech innovation that you are doing. How do you do your team composition? So those are some of the things that you'll find. They don't have even a strategy. So a young entrepreneur out there, you have to design a strategy. Like, what do I want to achieve in the next two years? Why do you want to achieve in the next five years? So I need to see what is your strategy plan? What is the starting point? You know? And a social entrepreneur start with empathizing with the community, which is the human-centered uh, uh, design uh, approach, where you empathize with the communities. You are going to pilot or test within a specific period of time. Mm -hmm. Then at the same time, you need to say, what is your scaling plan? Okay. What is, what is the other market? Where, which other communities are going through the same challenges or the same, uh, the same, uh, that need the same solution that you are having? So they need to do also a strategy of the growth and the scaling plan. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the quick mistakes that a young entrepreneurs will make, mm -hmm. especially in the social business aspect. Okay. Now, Social entrepreneurship is a good thing from how you put it because it solves people's problems. But I want you to talk to us about the tangible results from where you sit that you've seen social entrepreneurship bring on the table and the kind of impact it has had on the society. Do you know of such cases that you could tell the viewer? Yeah, so basically, let's, let, let me start with Nairobi here, mm -hmm. where we have had, we used to have Kanjo toilets. It was very hard for you to, to, to go to a washroom within Nairobi. But then, what happened? A young social entrepreneur looked at the situation, felt the situation is bad. We have the resource, we have the space, we have the toilets, but they are not usable. So what did the social entrepreneur do? 
he went and did a bargain and asked, would I transform the toilets to usable? I'll make I name Pesa there, I will do some other revenue channels, and I will charge the person maybe five shillings. And the users were happy because it comes at a cost, but it is efficient. Mm -hmm. So it is transformed the whole the whole situation around Nairobi. Nowadays, you, are not, you don't worry when you're walking around Nairobi. So that's uh, just a quick example like for the ones who are in Nairobi. Look at the health, for example. We have young people who are transforming the health sector through uh, reaching out to communities, through the digital device, like through education and health. Look at even the payments that we are doing now currently. People have devised simply simpler methods of doing uh, the payments and such. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, uh, the social enterprise at heart of transformation. Mm -hmm. it, again, social entrepreneurship places that at a national and a global competitive edge because the whole globe is guided by the sustainable development goals. And when you look at the sustainable development goals, it is now upon us as a nation to have our subsectors that are still addressing the same. Now the social entrepreneurs picks the pieces and composes solutions in line with the sustainable development goals. Okay. So when you are talking of the national priorities in line with the global priorities, the social entrepreneur becomes the driver. Mm -hmm. So that is how where I place the social entrepreneur. Okay. So you are from the Global uh, Grassroots Entrepreneurship Summit. Briefly before we let you go, what does it entail and what does it do? So basically, the Grassroots Entrepreneurship Summit has been brought forward by EBSAV Kenya, which is a youth-led organization that works towards empowering the young people and uh, towards social entrepreneurship. The reason why we came up with the Grassroots Entrepreneurship Summit is we realized that there is the Global Entrepreneurship Summit that really focuses on the big players in the market. And when we are talking about the Grassroots Entrepreneurship Summit, it's like the opposite that now gives the voice of young and upcoming entrepreneurs to have a conversation and pass out the message to the players and enablers in the ecosystem. So we, it's an annual event. Mm -hmm. It happens, we did the first one in 2018. We'll still be doing another one this year uh, in September. Mm -hmm. And the key focus this time around will be how do we engage young women in social entrepreneurship okay. because at the same time it also gives uh, gives the voice of the ones that are disenfranchised the ones that have been left behind by the end of it all we say no one should be left behind mm -hmm. we are also uh, bringing out their voices to be heard and documenting uh, the voices of the young entrepreneurs so we we are focusing on bringing out the players out here, the government, the NGOs, the private sector, the incubators, the accelerators, the venture funds, just to have a conversation, listen to the young entrepreneurs. And by the end of, of it all, mm -hmm. we devise new means okay. and new strategies mm -hmm. to improve the ecosystem. Thank you very much for making time. And thank you for allowing me to borrow your pen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Well, there you have it. Martin Irungu from EPSEV, which is uh, uh, the founders of Grassroots Entrepreneurship Summit. And for them, the key focus is social entrepreneurship for social transformation, creating solutions to real-time problems that Kenyans are facing. We've come to the end of the show and we'd like to say a big thank you to you for staying tuned from 7 to 9. We do not take it for granted. We thank you for your feedback. On behalf of the whole team that made it a success, from the producer Stephen Kimanigitao to the director Stephen Audi, we want to say a big thank you once again. We'll see you again next time. God bless you and keep it Metropole TV.